who I think is one of the great books of the 20th century. Yeah. But what's interesting about the book is not about Jews. Yes. And why? Well, and what does this say about Roth toward the end of his life? He's not going to win the Nobel Peace for uh, yeah. Nobel Prize. Uh, right. But this is the book he wants to write and will endure. Why no Jews in there? You know, I think that the, the main character is supposed to be Jewish, the one who's called Swede. Yeah. Um, he's nicknamed Swede because of his uh, appearance, yeah. but his last name is Lavov, and he is supposed to be Jewish. Yeah. So, the, and, but the daughter, so the daughter Mary, is supposed to be at least half Jewish. But um, I think part of what that book is about is this very process of becoming American. Swede has spent his life becoming American and embracing America, and then his daughter rejects it. And he doesn't understand why. He doesn't understand why she becomes radical. In, in the book, it's about this very sort of upright middle class citizen, and his daughter becomes like a, a left wing hippie terrorist and commits a bombing that ends up killing someone. And he doesn't understand why. And it's about this this generation gap. So that's I think how it ties into the Jewish story. It's about one generation Jews, his generation growing up very patriotic um, and believing in assimilation and sort of rebelling against convention and then the next generation not believing in America and rebelling in a much more political and much more, you know, sometimes dangerous way and then not understanding each other. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the I just wanted to, uh, in connection to what, what Jerry just said, uh, the, the, the human stain also has no Jew, and I think it's one of his greatest books. Uh, besides yeah. the, the, the Definitely. I think it's true that he has phases in his career and, and for in his earlier books, say for the first half of his career, the character of Nathan Zuckerman is his alter ego. And then at a certain point, it starts with American Pastoral, Zuckerman becomes the narrator that tells other people's stories, including Swede and um, I think, I don't know if the human scene is one of them, but there are others, um, where he's just sort of like in the background. And I think that at a certain point, Roth did want to stop writing about himself and his own life the way he did in earlier books and tell more independent kind of stories. Yes. There's in Roth a uh, uh, question of liberalism and it's, uh, versus uh, 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 Orgy Marsh. When, when um, Bellow begins to write later in life, he becomes increasingly neoconservative. Yeah. Roth becomes, Roth is a liberal, but who begins to worry about where liberalism is going. Uh, but when he's in Israel, he's very much opposed to the settlers. So there's a lot of political chasm Yes, um, between Roth and Bellow and inside her. Definitely, but I think they're both reacting to something similar, which is they're both, Bellow more so, but they're both reacting to how America changed starting in the 1960s. Um, and Bellow was sort of appalled by it and very opposed to it. Uh, Roth, I think, couldn't really separate himself from it because a lot of what he did, like Portnoy's Complaint, which was published in 1969, is sort of like the classic 60s novel because it tears down every taboo and it's very graphic and explicit. And it was a huge bestseller. It was very much in the mood of the period. But then as he gets older, he starts to wonder, you know, where, was this transformation good? Um, even though it was one that shaped him in so many ways. Bello, another interesting thing about Bello is that later in life, he was asked by Cynthia Ozick, um, why was it that all of you writers in the 1940s basically didn't have anything to say about the Holocaust and didn't seem to know what was going on? And he, this is an exchange of letters, and Bellow said, you're right, it was because we were so busy sort of making ourselves up and, and making up our own lives. We weren't really thinking about what was happening to Jews in other parts of the world. And I think that they had this feeling that they had been like shot out of a cannon and they were trying to go as fast as they could in the other direction. You know, they were trying to get out. and. Then a, a younger generation who has gotten out and is born in a sort of a mainstream American world can turn around and look back and say, well, wait a minute, look at all the things that you missed, look at all the things that you uh, left behind. And one thing that is quite interesting I th is that younger, uh, the sort of next generation of American Jewish writers, people who are in my age, like in their 40s, um, are much more interested in Judaism than older American Jewish writers were. People like, like Bello and Roth and Malamud um, even though they couldn't leave the subject of Jewishness alone, didn't really have any interest in Judaism or Jewish study or texts or things like that. Whereas writers like Nicole Krauss or Nathan Englander, um, people who are younger, are much more interested in those things and, and much more uh, interested in studying them and taking them seriously. So, like so that's a great segue because you, you, you yourself spent some time yeah. really immersed in, in classical Jewish sources and you chronicled a lot of that in Tablet Magazine and and it was remarkable to, to read all of that. And I, I'm just wondering, 
you know, what what that did to you yeah. as a, a Jew, an intellectual, a, a critic, a commentator. Sure. You know. Well, so you people may or may not have heard of Dafyomi. Dafyomi is a study program. It means a daily page. And it's a study program where Jews around the world read the same page of Talmud every day. And in the course of seven and a half years, you get through the whole Talmud, um, Babylonian Talmud. And I did this and wrote a column about it for Tablet Magazine, the online Jewish magazine. Um, and in fact, at the end of it, I went to Meadowlands, uh, to MetLife Stadium, to the Siyum HaShas, which is this giant celebration where the whole stadium, like 70,000 people, come to celebrate the com completion of this cycle. Almost all of them are Haredim, um, what you call ultra-Orthodox. Um, and I'm not, obviously, and so I felt a little bit out of place there, but not because of anything anyone said or did to me, just because I recognized the, the difference. Um, one difference is that I was doing it out of sort of personal interest and enrichment, and they were doing it in a, in a spirit of religious obligation. Um, so I, I think that having done that, the reason why I wanted to do it was that as I got more interested in Jewish texts and literature as I got older, I realized that if you don't know Talmud, at least some degree, uh, it's very hard to know anything about Judaism before the 18th century because that was sort of what everyone studied. It was the center of everything. And in, in studying it, I also came to understand a lot more about the difference between Orthodox and non-Orthodox Judaism in America. Um, and in fact, started and made connections among Orthodox communities that I wouldn't have made otherwise. Um, a good example of that, this is nothing to do with, with these guys I was just talking about, but there's a, a discussion in the Talmud early on in the cycle about how the right way to put on your shoes. And some of you may know this, I do not. That, so there's one rabbi says you put them on for, first the right, then the left, the other one says first the left and the right. So as a compromise, you put on one, then put on the other and tie that one, then you go back and tie the first. So that is something, and when I came across this, I wrote about it, and I, and that, I got all these emails and people saying, of course you do that. I mean, how could you not know? Like, how would you, what, are, what business do you have writing about the Talmud if you don't know something so basic? Because if you grow up Orthodox, you learn that as soon as you learn to tie your shoes, you learn that. Um, and I had never heard it. So that is a good example of the sort of culture clash. Uh, things that we don't know about each other as Jews. And I was glad to know more things like that, even if I, it didn't you know, change my practice. <laughs> I have yeah. a question relevant to this. Yeah. Can you describe to us the types of students you have in your classes? Percentage of Jews versus non-Jews? I am not teaching anymore, and I've never, I was, oh. I've never been a full-time academic. I'm really a journalist, and I work at the Wall Street Journal as an editor. That's my job for the last five years. In the past, I had used to teach at Columbia, um, not as a full-time faculty member, but like a course at a time, uh, an adjunct, um, in the American Studies Department and the Jewish Studies Department. And, and I've taught at a couple of other places too, but I've never been a teacher full-time. Um, so based on that and the fact that what I was teaching was often Jewish subject matter where most of the students were Jewish, um, I, haven't, I don't have the data set to answer that question. However, I, have, I do understand that there are fewer Jews in Ivy League universities than there used to be. Um, that that's changed over the last five years. Uh, there's an article about this in Tablet, in fact, um, which said it, it went through various elite institutions, universities, and, and prizes, and various things like that, and said, you know, in the last five to ten years, the percentage of Jews in all these places has gone down significantly. Still quite overrepresented in relation to the overall population, but maybe half of what it had been before. And um, and, and speculate about the reason for that. I think that that's definitely uh, true. I, I think that in general that's a true phenomenon, yeah, but I haven't observed it myself. One thing I did observe is that um, we hear a lot outside of campus about anti-Zionism and, and what a problem it is. And I, when I was at Columbia, there was a, what they call Israel Apartheid Week where students would build a barrier fence on the campus and sort of leaflet and hand things out. I think that those things, while they do exist, are usually not as big a deal to the students as they're made to seem um, when people outside the campus hear them. I mean, a lot, there's a lot going on on campus all the time. There's a very rich Jewish life and all kinds of things going on. That kind of thing does get a lot of attention, but I don't think it constitutes a threat in the way that people often worry that it does. Yeah. So picking up on one of your uh, comments a couple of minutes ago, <coughs> and, and, and not wanting you to go into a whole second lecture. Yeah. Uh, so 
the next generation of writers, yeah. who, who, who are they and do they have an open, can you discern an overall message of that or, or are they going in lots of different directions? I mean, people are going in different directions, but I think there is a commonality, which is that younger Jewish writers, and by younger I mean like people in their 40s and 50s um, who have been around long enough to publish a number of books, um, they're very interested in the Holocaust um, in the way that the writers I talked about today generally were not. Um, they, they write about it in all kinds of ways. Uh, I think of people like Michael Chabon. Um, I mentioned Nicole Krauss, Jonathan Safran Foer, Nathan Englander. Um, Dara Horn is a very good example. Dara Horn is actually maybe in some ways the best example because she is a Yiddish scholar <coughs> with a PhD and very interested in Jewish history and, and in Judaism, and all of her books are sort of about Jewish history in one way or another. Um, that's something that's very different because as I, as I mentioned earlier, I think that when you were growing up in a sort of Jewish slum in the 20s, you felt like there's nothing interesting here, everything interesting is somewhere else. And, and Jews made this great escape, right? And, and sort of rocketed into the middle class and the upper middle class. And then two or three generations later, the grandchildren of those people are looking back and saying, well, wait a minute, what about all this stuff that you jettisoned? Um, you never, you know, you didn't study any of this stuff. I never heard about any of this stuff. I'd like to know more. Dar in Dara Horn's novel, um, In the Imaged, I think it is, um, there's a, a thing about, her, her books often have a kind of magic realism, and one of the things that happens in them is that she writes about uh, Jews arriving on ships at Ellis Island, throwing their, uh, their talisim overboard, uh, and then someone later in the novel rescues one. Mm. And it's a sort of example of how she sees of her mission, is to sort of go back and rescue things that have been discarded. Yeah. Yeah, last summer I went on a bit, bit of a Philip Roth kick and uh, came across a book called uh, Patrimony, yeah. which is uh, just fantastic. And I just wondered if you could go between Malmed and, and uh, Bella, the you know, kind of works that they may have done that are like not as, that you regard very highly, but probably aren't as well known. Well, uh, yeah. yeah. I think that Malamud is probably not as, I think most of his novels are not very much read today. He's mainly read for his short stories, and probably his short stories are the best things he wrote and the most interesting. They tend to be very mysterious and um, evocative. The novels are a little bit more plotting and realistic, so they're, they're not as fun in a certain way. But The Assistant is definitely an interesting book, especially to understand how he thinks about Jews, because the story I mentioned about the Jewish shop owner who keels over while his employees fight. If you can imagine that as like a 300-page novel, that's sort of what the assistant is like. Um, it's about a, a Jewish shopkeeper who hires a non-Jewish assistant and continues to stay loyal to him even after he betrays him and betrays him and, and steals from him and does various things to him. And it's sort of a parable about Jews and non-Jews. And Bello, I think, is not nearly as much read as he once was, which is sad, uh, partly just because he's been gone longer. But I think that you know one of my favorite novels you know, of all novels is Herzog. Um, I think that's just a great book, very, very funny, um, brilliant descriptions and perceptions of things. And he takes, you know, serious things seriously, but also sees the, the funny side. Any, any last question? So in your last comment about younger people, um, this is not the reason I raised my hand, but just younger people, younger Jews now reflecting back. We I mean, look about moving down to the Lower East Side in Williamsburg. Right? Yeah. Although, yeah. Not they, the it's not the same culture, yeah. No, but it, it is going back to the same place, except now they're like million dollar condos. Yeah, <laughs> um, but it is funny. I mean, if you had told people in Williamsburg in the 20s that one day everyone would want to live in Williamsburg, they would be very surprised. Yeah. Very true. Yeah, one last question? Yeah, I, again, I love that all. Going back to the style, I think there are two writers, I think, that really picked up that great talking book. One, I think, is Joseph Heller. Mm. When God knows about King David, and yeah. the other is Mordecai Ripley, who's not American. Oh, and yes, it's fantastic. Yeah. I think yeah. It's called Barney's version. It's yes, just talk, and it's so brilliant. Those are both. Yes, I agree. Those are both great <laughs> writers, and also um, <coughs> Howard Jacobson is another one. He's an English writer, uh, alive now. I think he's probably in his sixties, and you know, he's like Philip Roth in a lot of ways. He writes these very body, funny novels about English Jews. Epstein, Joseph. Joseph Epstein is a different case, I think. He's more of the Bella generation. Yeah. Thank you all very much.
I advise you all to uh, go out and get his book, The Blessing and the Curse, because uh, there's the rest of the world, and he deals with Israeli uh, writers and European writers. There still are European Jewish writers, and a wonderful concluding section on the philosophy um, of Judaic life today. So he's a great talent. Really appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thank you.